Hi, it's Sam Hunter, and we are week four in our series on chaos. We decided to call it this chaos series. The Holy Spirit put that on our hearts because we, we are living in a chaotic time. Chaos all around us, in our country, um, in, in the world. And it is true that if you look back over just the last 100 years in our country, the last 120 years, go back to 1900, there's been chaos all the time. It does seem more intense now. It may or may not be, but nevertheless, we are living in chaos. And so we decided to call this series the Chaos Series and to look at it and approach it from a macro and a micro. A macro and a micro. What's the big picture? Macro, micro, what does it mean to you? So we started the first week with who's in charge? Who is in charge? Because it sure doesn't look like God's in charge. So we broke that down, and at the end, we, set, we just decided to stick with what Jesus said to Peter on the beach when he's walking along in John 21, and he, Peter turns around and sees John back behind him, John the disciple, and says, well, what about him? And Jesus says, what's that to you? You follow me. And that has become our focus and our mantra for these last four weeks. What is that to you? You follow me because it always comes back to me or you and your relationship with Jesus. Yes, there's other things going on. And yes, there's chaos. And yes, there's, there's, there are people in your life who are causing chaos. But the, the bottom line is it always comes back to you and Jesus. And he can handle all the rest. So the first week was who is in charge. The second week, we paused and said, is God's will God's way? Could any of this be part of God's will and God's way? So we broke that down, and you want to go back and check that out. Last week, we talked about, well, if there is this chaos, and there are all these things going on, do we have enemies? Because it sure looks like we have enemies from a macro standpoint all around the world, Russia, North Korea, Iran, China for sure are probably our biggest enemy at this point, that, who, that does want to take over America, wants to become the leading country in the world and, and, and actually dominate America. Yes, we have enemies out there from a macro. But the real question is, do you have enemies? And what we wanted to tease out was, well, you may have people who are acting like enemies, purposely or not purposely, but nevertheless, the result is that, they, that the effects in your life or your family's life or the people you love, it, it, the end result is they are behaving as enemies. But are they really the enemy? And what happens in our heart when we look at them as evil enemies versus pulling back, as we see in Ephesians 6, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, your, your battle is not against flesh and blood. Well, yes, it is. It sure looks like it. That person over there who's messing up my life or my family's life or my child's life, it sure looks like flesh and blood. But the Holy Spirit says, no, no, that's not your real enemy. The real battle is against Satan and whoever he has working. So in the end, we realized, instead of looking at someone and saying That's a, that is a, an enemy, look at them and say, perhaps they are being used by the enemy, but they're not the enemy. And that softens my heart. And instead of calling them an evil person, perhaps we would say they are doing wrong. And that softens my heart. So as we ended the meeting last week, we said, okay, if we have enemies, or if we have people who are acting as enemies, what do we do? How do we respond? And that's where we're going to pick up this week. We touched on it towards the end of last week, and we're going to pick it up this week and go full steam ahead. We call this forgiveness with muscle, and you should look at your hand out and print your hand out, out as you look at this. The very first scripture passage I have is one that we discussed over the last couple of weeks, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And we said that we're not talking about a Hebrew word that means motion. We're talking about a Hebrew word that means to be still in your heart, to find that peace and stillness in your heart. But even more so, this word, this Hebrew word behind this be still, it has a strong connotation of letting your hands go limp, letting your hands go loose. Be still, drop your hands, let your hands go limp, let your hands go loose, quit white knuckling. 
So we did a little exercise with the men. I had them stand up behind their chair and grab their chair and white knuckle it. I mean, just hold on to it tight. And then I said, now I want you to lift that. I want you to lift your hands up and receive blessings from Lord, from the Lord, but don't let your hands off of that chair. And of course, nobody could do that. So the first step is to loosen my grip on whatever it is I'm white knuckling. Let my hands go limp. Let them loose, drop loosely by my side. Now, the next interesting step about this is that the word Jew comes from Judah, and in the Hebrew, that's Yehuda, and, and the very base root word goes back to this word of hand, but it's not just any hand. It's an open hand, and it's not just any open hand, but it's an open hand in praise of God and of Jesus. So the exercise we did, we said, grab hold of this chair, white knuckle it, try to praise Jesus, try to, re try to receive something from Jesus with your hands gripping this chair. Now let go of the chair, let your hands drop loose, release that chair, and then start to raise your hands up so that you can receive and that you can praise. It's a great exercise, you should try it. So what we're doing here is we're trying to figure out how do we deal with people who are acting as enemies in our lives? How do we respond? And so we looked at this, these words that we see in the New Testament, these two different words for forgive. But let me start with Matthew 5, 25. Jesus tells us, gives us practical advice. He says, if you have a dispute with someone, settle it before you get into a courtroom. And that is good advice. And he says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. And if you, if you don't, you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out of that prison until you have paid the last penny. My friend, he is not talking about practical advice. He's talking about your heart and your spirit and the unforgiveness that you carry in it. And if you don't release, if you don't settle this thing out, if you don't let it go and let your hands go limp, you put yourself in a prison of your own making. And you will not get out of that prison until you have paid the last penny in blood, sweat, and tears, in peace and contentment and joy. And let me assure you, those around you will suffer. If any of you have ever gone through a divorce and you carried that animosity or that angst against your ex, Put yourself in a prison is what you did, and you know that. You may still be in that prison. Your children, they, they absorbed that. They could see what was going on. So you put your children in a prison too. Jesus says, you got to let this thing go. You got to release it. You got to settle it out, or you're putting yourself in a prison. So the first step we said in, in, in going towards forgiveness is to release. And the Greek word aphiemi, which is on your handout, it carries a strong connotation of release. It, forgiveness is not a bad translation. It's just not the best translation. So if we go to Matthew 6, 14, which is at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What is wrong with that statement? because that is an absolute contradiction to everything we've been taught about grace. On the first level, it's conditional forgiveness. But on the next level, and the more important level, is when you have surrendered your life to Jesus and you're born again, all of your sins, past, present, future, they're all forgiven. They're wiped out. So what can this mean can Jesus really be saying, if you don't forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you? And no, that is not what he's saying. It's an insufficient translation, not a bad one. It just doesn't get the fullness. Let's read it as it should. But if you do not release others their sins, your father will not release your sins. We're not, will not release you. He will not release you out of that prison that you put yourself in, that Jesus just said you're in and you won't get out until you paid the last penny, until you release and get your, release yourself from that prison. Your heavenly father is under no obligation to release you. He has released you 
from the worst of debts, the worst of prisons, the prison of sin and the prison of damnation and the prison of self and darkness. He's released you from that and you, you won't release someone else. So he's going to leave you in that prison. He's not going to lift a finger to get you out of it because you put yourself in it. And he is not in any way obligated to help you release yourself out of that. He will, but you've got to do it. Aphiemi, the first step in, in forgiving is releasing it, letting it go. You don't owe me anything. You're not, I'm not going to ask you to pay me back. Let, I've let it go. I've released it. Now, who are we called as Christians to release in, in this sense of forgive? Everyone. Everyone. You release anyone who is sinned against you. That is what you're called to do. You release, you release, you release. What does it take to get to this point? Because that's not an easy step for someone who's really wounded you, who's really harmed you, who's really hurt you, or your children or your family, whatever the situation is. Because see, you may not be so as worried about the chaos in the macro sense. You've got chaos in your own life. In the micro world of your own world, you've got chaos. And what do you do with that? You've got to release it. You got to let it go. And what does it take to do that? Well, it takes some hard work. Then it becomes a matter of common sense because you're only drinking rat poison and waiting on the rat to die. But then it takes humility. And then it, that humility comes from self-awareness that, you know what? <laughs> I've done the same thing. I've done it probably more times than this person. I've hurt other people. Maybe I meant to, maybe I didn't, probably both. But how can I not release that person when I know what I've done. You know, it's interesting when Jesus gives the top two commandments, which certainly everyone would have known they're the top two, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and, and all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. A really interesting translation of that love your neighbor as yourself, and probably more appropriate is love your neighbor because he is yourself. Love your neighbor because you're no different. He's no different. She's no different than you. You're both sinners. And his, may be, his or hers may be different than yours, but you love them because you're the same people. You're both sinners. You don't hold it against anyone. And in our discussion today, we are releasing. Now, that release, that aphemi is every time you see the word forgive in the New Testament, it's aphemi, with the exception of one time. And that's in Colossians. And the word there is charizomai, and it means restore. It's forgiveness with muscle. First step is release. But then the next step as a follower of Jesus is to go restore the relationship. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive whatever differences, grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But think about this. Release and restore as the Lord released and restored you. Bear with each other and release and restore one another. Whatever grievances you may have against each other. Release and restore as the Lord released and restored you. Now we're really getting into an 800 level course. You know, this is the real challenge. It's hard enough sometimes to release someone, but to contemplate going back and restoring that relationship. To you, for you to be the one to step out and say, hey, I, wanna, I want us to be restored. I want to reconcile this relationship. What is that going to take? Well, that's going to take a lot of humility. And that's going to take a lot of dying to self, which is probably the best exercise you can have as a follower of Jesus, learning to die to self, die to self, die to self. It's going to take a lot of dying to self to do that. It's going to take grace. And I think it's going to take gratitude, gratitude for what has been, the, the, for you to have been released and restored, for you to have been reconciled, the gratitude that you carry with you because of that propels you to offer that to someone else, to release and restore. We said with Aphiemi, the release, we're called to do that with everyone. Who primarily are you called to restore, to Carol Zomei? Well, let's start with your family. Anyone in your family, anyone extended. I know, I know people who haven't spoken to their mother 
who haven't spoken to their father in years, who haven't spoken to their brother, their sister, their children, their best friends, not going to do it. And can you imagine the prison they're in? But if they can, if they can get out there to restore it, the joy that comes with that, not only is it, does it serve you personally, it pleases your heavenly father. You are within his will. So the idea of the first step being released, the second step being restore, I want you to go to my website, 721ministries.org, 721ministries.org. Go to the past radio shows, and you can click on that, and then you can, you can scroll down to August 23rd, 2019. August 23rd, 2019. And I interview a friend named Rick Lucas. It's a short interview. You must go listen to it. Rick Lucas is a friend through Britain down in Jacksonville who told me the story one day. And I said, okay, after hearing that, I got to get you on the radio. I got an interview on the radio show about his father, who was the head of the KKK in Northern Florida as he was growing up and who took him to lynchings and burnings and all kind of horrible things as a young boy, terrible things he had to witness. And this father was an alcoholic and beat his mother and beat him and beat his brother. Terrible. But then his father died. And the story Rick tells about coming to the point of being able to forgive his father. He couldn't, he couldn't restore with his father. But as he was telling me the story the first time, he told me what it took, where he had to get to, to be able to do that. And that's why I want you to listen to the show. Because it, 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 it took me aback what he said about how he had to, how, what he had to do to get to the point where he could release and, and do his best to restore, even though his father was dead, you've got to listen to it. It's not easy to restore with people who have hurt you, but we're called to do that. Now, how uh, are we called to restore with everyone? Well, there's some people that you just cannot restore with. You can try, and you're called to try. Let me pick up Matthew 18, 21. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do we forgive someone? Seven times, thinking that's a really good number. And Jesus says, no, there's no limit to affirming someone, to releasing someone. 77 times, even more than that. So that's release. We always release. No limit on that. But if someone has sinned against you 77 times, you may not be called to restore with that person. There are people out there who you cannot restore with. Your job is to release, but not everyone can you restore. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That means there's some people you cannot live at peace with. You cannot restore. You just have to release. 1 Corinthians 7, 15, Paul is writing about marriage. You can imagine being a Gentile, being a Greco-Roman in, in, the, in the city where, uh, in Corinth, which is like Las Vegas, wild and willy and crazy. And they never heard of this Jewish stuff. And suddenly you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you've become a follower of this Jesus, this Jew from Palestine. And your husband, your wife says, forget that. You've lost your mind. Here's Paul's words, the Holy Spirit through Paul. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. We are called to live in peace. And that is our next topic next week is to be peacemakers. This is all building on each other. But we cannot live in peace with people who refuse to live in peace with us. So you cannot restore with everyone, but you are, recall, you are called to release with everyone. And then for those that are in your world, in your life, in your family, yes, you must reach out and try to restore with them. Now, I want to share with you a quick story, and it's really a fascinating, fascinating little nugget in the scripture. If you're a Bible nerd like me and you pick up on something like this, we just spoke about Colossians, where Paul writes about reconciling and charismatic restoring. There's another letter in the New Testament, a little short letter called Philemon. And Paul is writing to a 
wealthy man named Philemon, who has become a believer, follower of Jesus, holds a, a weekly service or meetings in his own home. But Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who stole from him and ran away. The penalty for that is death in the Roman, Greco-Roman world, immediate death. But Onesimus meets Paul in Rome while Paul is in jail in Rome. He's not really in jail. He's under house arrest. Onesimus is converted, and Paul sends him back with a letter to Philemon, asking Philemon to release and restore Onesimus. Do you know where Philemon lives? He lives in Colossae, where the letter to the Colossians was written. So what's so cool about this, and I'm going to read this to you from uh, Colossians 1. First, let me read from Colossians 1, 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you, restored you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. That's what release and restore looks like, without blemish and free from accusation. Then as he closes this letter to the, to the family of believers in Colossae, he says, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother and a faithful minister. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. Paul is sending two men to this city in Turkey called Colossae. One of them is Tychicus, who's a free man. The other one is a runaway slave. They're both carrying, they're each carrying, they're both carrying two letters, one that we call Colossians and the one that we call Philemon. And here's how this letter goes with Philemon. Paul is writing to him. He's sending back this man who is worthy of death penalty. And he says, I don't, I, I don't want you just to release him. I want you to restore him. So in, Col in the letter to the Colossians, we see this word charismai for the first time. And then in an accompanying letter that's going with these two men to the same place, we see a living example of it. It is so cool. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, our sister, that's probably uh, Philemon's wife, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, maybe his son, and to the church that meets in your home. So see, he's putting Philemon out on notice. He's putting this into the public realm. He's sending two letters. Both are to be read by the church, but one's personal to Philemon. And he starts asking, he starts explaining what's happening with, with the slave Onesimus, and he says, perhaps the reason he was separated you from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. Wait a minute. Philemon would say, wait a minute, Paul. Okay, I'll let him come back. I'll give him his old job. You know, slaves want the same thing as we, as we think of slaves in the antebellum South. He could have just been an indebted servant. But either way, he had a job. And if I'm Philemon, I'll say, well, I'll let him come back and have his job. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. He deserves to be killed, but I'll do it because we're all, we're all Christians. You know, we're following Jesus. We have a different way of living. But I'm not considering him to be a brother. But Paul says, yes you, yes, you will, because you're called a charismai, another brother, a fellow believer. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man as, and as a brother in the Lord. Are you kidding me? So if you consider me a partner, Philemon, welcome him as you would welcome me. This is the living, breathing example of Charizomai, someone who has stolen from you, who has run away from you, who has committed crimes punishable by death. And I want you to receive him, release him, and restore him. Such a great story. And the two men leaving Rome with two letters are going to the same city and the same home church. 
Now, it's interesting that Onesimus, the, the church fathers tell us, these would be the Billy Grahams of the, of the time, tell us that Onesimus went on to become the bishop of Ephesus after Timothy died. Paul dies, Timothy, who was a younger man, becomes the bishop after John, actually the disciple John, the apostle John. Timothy becomes a bishop, and then Onesimus becomes a bishop. Former slave, could have been executed, becomes the bishop of Ephesus. That, my friend, is what happens when we live according to Jesus' desire. FEME release, Carol Zemea restore. Now I'm going to finish with this to set it up for next week. We're still in Colossians. The very next verse, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Next week, we're going, to, we're going to talk about being a peacemaker. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You see, when I was learning to play basketball years ago, one of the things they said, when you're on defense, it's always got to be man, you, ball. You've got to be between man, you, and the ball. You all got to always see the ball. On defense, you do not let someone get the baseline. You put your foot out of, out of the baseline to keep them from getting the baseline. These are things that are just trained and drilled into you. If you are backing up on defense and a fast break is coming your way and there's three against two or whatever, it doesn't matter, your number one thing is you've got to stop the ball. You just learn that. You have to do it. And if you're running the fast break, the number one thing is make them stop you. Because until they stop the ball, you can take it in for a layup. These things are drilled into your head in sports. You're given these things. If you're a wide receiver and the quarterback starts scrambling, you break, get your hand up, and start going to an open spot. These things are trained into us. Whatever profession you're in, you quite likely have rules that just that guide you in what you're doing. When I was in the contracting business, construction business, if I was doing a takeoff on a renovation job, I didn't count every two by four. I understood I had rules that I followed for that takeoff. When I was in the, renovate, when I was in the uh, development business, and if there were going to be 200 lots in a development, I had a formula that I followed for, for working up my costs for that potential development. We all have these rules. I got a friend, a friend who's a caterer. He, he has a system of rules. So that's all to say, what if your system of living was that the peace of Christ was your rule. Whatever situation you find yourself in, the peace of Christ is my rule. That doesn't mean I'm going to be a doormat. But whatever I'm going to do in any particular situation, the peace of Christ is going to flow from within me. I may have to have some tough love. I may have to be set a record straight. Or I may not. I may just die to self. But whatever position I'm taking, whatever response I have, the peace of Christ is going to flow from within me. What if that was your rule, that in any situation you thought, okay, well, now what, what I do next, I want it to be the peace of Christ ruling my next step. Someone has aggravated me. Someone has hurt me. Someone has done me wrong. Someone has blocked my progress. Someone has hurt one of my children. What, I got to straighten the situation out. Whatever, I've been attacked. I've been accused. I've been insulted. Whatever it is, I live by the peace of Christ is my rule. So anything I do, my rule, which I have now, after all, not Sam, this is what we would hope, that after so many years of, of living this way, it now becomes automatic. I don't have to think about it anymore. I'm, uh, just like in sports or in business or in the military, anything you're trained over and over, it becomes second nature, that the peace of Christ is my rule. Whatever it is, it's going to be through the peace of Christ. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at what the peace of Christ looks like when we look at how Jesus handles and interacts with John 8, 1, where an adulterous girl is thrown in front of him, and then John 4 with the Samaritan woman at the well. Next week, we're going to talk about peacemakers, and we're going to look at the disciples. And if you start to understand the background of these 12 disciples, you'll understand it when Jesus says in John 17, if you are one, if you live with unity, then the world is going to know that I'm for real. And when you understand their background and how impossible that would be, you'll understand that what 
What Jesus is saying is the way you live is going to show the world who I am. And the early Christians in the first century in Rome, in, in, across the Greco-Roman Empire, were known for their love and their unity and their peace. My friend, learn to release, but then go that next step and learn to restore. Jesus, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you make it so clear to us what you want us, what you call us to do so that we can live and walk in the light that is truly light. We pray this, name in your, pray this in your name because you are the king, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening in today. We'll see you next week.